Hey, hey, happy Wednesday. I'm your host, Ryan Duffy, and this is episode five of Pathfinder. Today, we have a special guest on the show to talk about NASA, commercial space, pork, and barrels. And she's a brand new author. I mean, literally, the book was published one week ago. I hope you're excited to dig in, but first, you know the drill. A word from today's sponsor. Our reliance on satellites for navigation, communications, commerce, and intelligence has grown exponentially in the new space economy. Unfortunately, the risks have grown as well. The need to prioritize cybersecurity around space assets is critical. Spider Oak Mission Systems provides space cybersecurity products for military, commercial, and civilian operators. Their Orbit Secure solution is the first to deliver zero trust security to zero gravity environments, protecting space communication, command, control, data transmission, storage, and integrity at the data level. To learn more about Orbit Secure, check out spideroak-ms.com. Again, that's spideroak-ms.com. Good morning, Payload Nation and Pathfinder listeners, and welcome to episode number five. Today's guest is not afraid to ruffle a few feathers, speak truth to power, fight against entrenched interests, uh, or break what she calls the self-interested space industrial cycle. Lori Garber is the former deputy administrator of NASA, among many other things. And today we're going to be talking about her efforts to make a dent in the universe. Lori, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's good to be with you. So despite my best efforts, I tried to cobble together a con condensed version of your resume, but I didn't think that I could do it full justice. So would love to just hear you know, a quick elevator pitch, lightning tour of the various posts you've had and just hear from yourself, you know, the, the, the resume. Sure. Um, I started my career working for John Glenn, but my comment on that usually is, I don't know how many people have gotten so uh, much out of a receptionist job. So I literally answered the phones on John Glenn's presidential campaign in 1983 and 84. I eventually became a scheduler, but that was not a space policy job. I went from there to the National Space Society, where I did stay for 13 years, began there as receptionist as well, but became executive director a few years later, and then went to NASA. My first tour of NASA was 1996 to 2001. I ended up running the policy office. Uh, that was a political appointee job. So on January 20th of 2001, I had to leave uh, with President Clinton. And I went for the eight years, I was in the private sector at an aerospace consulting firm called the Avicent Group. I, during that time, had a stint, as I just outlined in the book called Astro Mom, where I tried to go to space with um, on a Russian Soyuz, I figured. And then in 2008, I was tapped after volunteering to be Hillary's uh, space policy advisor on her campaign, and previously done the same for Senator Kerry in his presidential campaign, I was tapped by then Senator candidate for President Obama to lead his transition team for NASA. And when he won the election, I immediately got to work on that for a few months before being nominated to be his deputy administrator of NASA. Since then, I went to the Airline Pilots Association, where I was the general manager, and then started a nonprofit called Earth Rives while I wrote a book. Yeah, yeah. And also, I should mention, narrated the book. And I must confess, I am I have I have rather peculiar reading habits or reading or uh, listening habits. More accurately, I read the book twice in the last week on. 2.05 x speed. So it is a bit of a it's a bit of a mental adjustment for me right now hearing hearing you speak at 1x speed, but I'm getting used to it. Oh, my one of my kids, one of my sons who's probably your age did that as well. I, I personally preferred at 1.2. I do not like it at 1. Much too slow. Yeah, yeah. It's just we we got, you know, you you're you you get it. We're we're busy. We got places to be. So on to the main main task at hand, escaping gravity, my quest to transform NASA and launch a new space age. Can you walk us through the decision to write this book? Was it a eureka moment or was it more of sort of a gradual realization that the story needed to be told? Sure, probably the latter. But when I left NASA in 2013, a couple of journalists and writers asked for my notes 
and we're writing books, for instance. And while I was happy to collaborate, I realized I had um, a very unique window on a very important uh, time in our history, both coming early in the 80s and 90s, and then this more senior position uh, from 2008 to 2013. And I decided I needed to tell that story. It likely would not have been completed by now without COVID. And I never intended it to come out and be, you know, something so controversial with the person running NASA being talked about extensively in in the book. I'm sure we'll get into that as well. But it really was a story I felt was important, not only for NASA to understand um, the the public who funds NASA to elevate these issues, to say, you know, we've we've got a lot of really valuable things we do on space and we don't um, probably focus and prioritize on those as much as we should. But then the broader message is, to government and how we all need to look at the kinds of things we're doing today in a way that should address challenges that are current rather than in the past. And I do think COVID is an example of something that we weren't prepared for in this country, whereas we've been spending hundreds of billions of dollars a year on defense programs often aimed at fighting past wars. And it's the same military industrial complex that has this, you know, relentless momentum of the status quo. Yeah. Yeah. I actually noticed that there at the end of the book, you, in the, the epilogue, uh, you kind of, you, you widen the aperture a bit to beyond space. And then there's also, we were talking about this briefly before we went on air, but you, you, there's a lot of really important historical geopolitical context in this book. And I know Eisenhower's mentioned a few times, and I actually did not know that Eisenhower slashed the military budget 25%. Obviously the quote is about the uh, formation guarding against the military industrial complex that is etched in any, any good history student's memory, but yeah, that, that there, there are, there are a lot of connections, which we'll, we'll, we'll continue to unpack. On the topic of COVID, you had an interesting vignette where, sadly, you know, you weren't able to go to that first crewed SpaceX launch. Was that was that a gut punch, or was were the countervailing emotions of seeing everything finally, you know, manifest? Did that just make make it all like best day ever? You know, that launch was in the middle, not just of COVID, but the, just a couple of days after, um, you know, the the murder of George Floyd. And so I live in Washington, D.C. We were going to marches in our masks with our signs. Um, you know, I initially would never have imagined not being at the first commercial crew launch. Just would not have been imaginable. And really hard for the, the team of us um, – who helped create the policy aspects of this. I really tried to be very clear in the book that SpaceX gets all props for actually doing this. Um, as I say, we, you know, left breadcrumbs that could be followed and they were needed, but so were followers. Um, and I look forward to having more than one of those, but during the launch itself, when it happened, um, I was sobbing and I think it was a relief that it was happening. I think it was sadness over what was happening. The country felt torn apart. The coverage I saw, I think on CNN was a split screen, you know, with the demonstrations um, and a little bit of certainly fear and hope that it went well. There, as I also say in the book, escaping gravity perfectly every time isn't going to be possible. And of course, I didn't put a single finger point on any of the hardware that took uh, Bob and Doug to space, but drafting the policy that got there, I would have, of course, felt terrible if it was not successful. So lots of emotional things going on. And I did personally get to the second launch. I just couldn't stay away. And um, really, that was more elation, I'd say. Yeah, yeah. I think that that is a it's 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 good that you you add that because I actually remember 
where I was that day. And I, I was not at Payload. I was at a, a different newsletter company. And in the top blurb, you know, I wrote that there had been a historical launch four decades ago. And, it, you know, it's, it's escaping me now, but I wrote that the, that the, the nation was convulsing under, under racial you know, just, justice protests. And it just kind of felt like it felt like a new, like 40 years later, there's this paradigm shift. But I think that that's a good reminder that, that none of these things exist in a, a, a vacuum. Um, what were the hardest, what were the hardest parts of writing this book? That's not an easy question, but it could be anything from, I don't know if you needed special clearances to tell certain parts of the story that haven't been told before, or just the actual act of sitting down and writing the damn thing or something else that I'm not anticipating. Yeah. I think for me, the hardest part was walking a line of being able to tell the story without so much negative emotion that I felt at the time and knowing really smart, good people were fighting against me and how that felt and writing it in a way that didn't, I'm not trying to damage their reputations. Um, As I say in the author's note, if I could have told it without having some of these conversations with revered people, um, I would have. But the point is, it's really hard to make change, meaningful change in government. And people like me who came at it maybe from a different perspective, brought something different to it and change is hard. So yes, there was pushback. And these people who push back, they, they thought they were doing it, I presume for positive reasons, but they had been in these positions for a long time, sort of, you know, a, if you're a hammer, you, everything you look at looks like a nail. If you build big rockets, you just want to build a big rocket. Or if you're an astronaut, you just want to send more astronauts the same way you've been doing it. And those were really hard decisions. And um, in the first week, the response has been from my friends who know what I was going through. Some of them still at NASA have written and said they think I walked the line well. I'm sure those people themselves who um, are quoted in the book as you know, being opposed to programs that are now working well and pushing very hard for programs that are not working well um, are, aren't happy with with the line. Lots of people have reported, you know, I didn't pull any punches. Well, that is in fact not true. <laughs> I pulled a lot of punches and there were versions that were much harsher. <laughs> so, you know, um, as I've tried to say to people who have concerns, well, it was It was harder to live through than retail. So um, the process, I'm not a writer. I actually sort of enjoyed it, though. And having COVID and being alone so much gave me the time and the bandwidth to take it on. And in many ways, that process um, was cathartic. Yeah, well, from one writer to another, I think you did a very, very fantastic job. And it is it's a. I, I've said this before, again, off air, but it's quite an encyclopedic tour de force that includes all of these, you know, thorny geopolitical, historical, social, so cultural issues. I actually wanted to, I had this bookmarked before we move on. Where is it? Oh, so this question comes from Jess, our director of operations. How did you mentally and emotionally deal with the adversity that you faced initially at the agency? You know, I think in in your intro, you said, you know, I had no fear and didn't mind um, taking different positions. I think the reason that was the case is because it was really important what I was trying to achieve. And I knew that it was our best path forward. So... I don't want to be, you know, sort of the skunk at the party um, in general, but if I, I sometimes characterize this as say your loved one is an alcoholic, um, you don't serve them drinks, you, you work toward um, them getting better. And I wanted NASA to get better because I value it so much. And we all knew 
just looking at it, 50 years since Apollo, people are so frustrated we haven't gone back. We love to just say, oh, you know, it's those, it's political, um, a lack of political will. Well, let's look at that. Let's, let's talk about what got us that political will. It was a Cold War. Are we trying to recreate a Cold War in order to justify a space program? That's backwards. There's a lot of ways to justify a space program, and we should do that honestly. And when you set those goals, then you should develop your programs to best meet them, not just to suit what you've always done and to suit the people that already do it. Um, that's hurtful. I'm I'm well aware, and that's a message that internally was hard um, to deliver, but I could not and would not have done it if I thought there was a better path. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm glossing over a lot of history here, but now to, 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 you know, fast forward a, a decade or, or, or even more, I'm actually just going to take this straight from the, the, the book flap, but as the head of the NASA transition team for president elect Barack Obama and second in command of the agency, Garver drove policies and funding that enabled commercial competition just as the capabilities and resources of the private sector began to mature. And I think that you are fairly and widely credited for a lot of the the, the renaissance or, or, I don't know, rebirth in competition and, and, and commercial space. Uh, and, and then as you write later in the book, Victor, what is it? I'm I'm a writer. I should know this, but but you're a writer too, and and you wrote it. So victory or success has a thousand fathers, and so now that's another interesting element of the book that really stuck out to me is how folks started to change their tune, and maybe there were there are some revisionist accounts of how it all went down. Imagine that in Washington, <laughs> hypocrisy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, how does that how does that feel? Is that okay with you? Because ultimately, all of this was willed in, into reality, or does it sting a little bit? Well, this really was a journey because I did start writing well before uh, either SpaceX had launched people. The program was a success, certainly before uh, one of the people who fought doing the program that Obama put together for a commercial crew and canceling Constellation. That person then became head of NASA. So as I was writing and those things were happening, that was, of course, very interesting. I think my publisher might have been a little bit more excited than I was to have one of the chief antagonists in the book become head of NASA during this time. And I don't try to overstate the um, his conflict. He very clearly had a goal to keep Constellation contracts. He did that successfully by getting SLS and Orion. And in a very famous hearing a month after our budget proposal, he said, what if we were to transfer the $6 billion you propose for commercial crew to the big rocket program since we have the power of the purse? Um, He ultimately helped really champion this um, compromise and is still talking about the value of this compromise. And Sure, compromise is a wonderful word. We don't have many compromises in Washington, but this particular compromise embedded a conflict, (laughs) which is between the private sector, low Earth orbit astronaut transportation, and the SLS and Orion, which is still getting a lion's share of the money and not yet even launched their test flight, not reusable, all, all of that, which I'm sure we can discuss. But that that was something that I did not foresee when I started writing the book and just watching his hearing, his confirmation hearing and having he and former Senator K. Bailey Hutchinson say that they created the commercial program, the commercial crew program in their legislation. I mean, I had to laugh. I mean, they, and and factually, I'm just going to say, okay, true, fair enough. Their legislation does codify it. But by the way, it was codified since 1985 in the NASA Space Act that said you will, um, that that one of NASA's purposes is to develop commercial space. And that that just is, um, I think, had to be pointed out. And I also 
believe that a lot of reporters don't point things like that out because they don't want to lose their access to NASA. And sure, I could be that person. Um, but it's more important, I think, that people know someone is paying attention. And our space program is worth more than just a few people wanting to uh, feather their own nests. And we revisionist history has no place at NASA other than on Apple TV with the... Uh, oh, that's, that is a great point. Right, the um, for all mankind. For all mankind, yeah. We we talk about that, but that is revisionist history at its finest. Yes, it is. But boy, oh boy, I mean, staying on the topic of revisionist history for a second, could you imagine though if all of that funding had been siphoned away to Constellation from Commercial Crew, what a different world it would look like? They would still be able to say. It couldn't have ever happened. This is the problem. You, you know, once once you start down a path, you really don't know what could have happened. And I know I do get a little harsh, I think, with people will, will feel in just trying to make the point that, yes, many people got on board, most everyone now, including Senator Nelson, now Administrator, and including then Administrator Charlie Bolden. Um, but what is missing in this, oh, I didn't believe in it at first, and then I got on board, is if me or someone else who could have maybe been deputy and stood up to that had um, not pursued it, it wouldn't have been there to come around to the, your position uh, a couple years later. So I sort of characterize it like a lifeguard withholding their life preserver when someone's drowning until they're safely toward shore. <laughs> Great that you got, you know, you waded in. Um, and that was important uh, eventually, but by then there wouldn't have been a program to support if, if um, I hadn't really fought. And so, you know, that's one of the reasons that I think people might feel um, I don't mind standing up for things I believe in. Yeah. So, so these next two questions will be kind of connected, but can you rank the, the most powerful elements of opposition if you had to in, in descending order? I mean, obviously there's, there's the Apollo era commanders and, and you also see this actually in return to space, which, which debuted a few months ago, but you know, you see that in, the, in video and then you tell the story multiple times, but also the, the senators from key states some of whom we've already talked about the the defense kind of contractor lobby the cup boys i was not familiar with that term before but yeah i mean who was who's the most influential in trying to stave off change maintain the status quo sure it it is they are all related and so this is um a, a really interesting way to look at it the cup boys you don't know the term because I sort of just, I didn't create it. My friend D. Lee, who was head of procurement at NASA in the 90s, uh, used it to refer to the retired military guys at NASA who carried around their cups with their, um, you know, call signs on them, Zorro and Mini and Dragon and Panther. And, you know, it's an exclusionary thing for those of us who are not, uh, don't, don't have um, our own call signs from being in the military. But I will say that that type of person, the entrenched senior bureaucrats in NASA who wanted to do what they came to do and what they were already trying to do, I put them at the top of the list of um, powerful elements arguing against us because if they were on board, you know, they're feeding Congress. They're feeding industry. Industry wants to make them happy and they want to make industry happy and everybody wants to make Congress happy. Um, and so this is what was frustrating to me sometimes is like the calls coming from inside the house. We're part of the administration and this path was um, something that the administration proposed. But again, in the book, I don't really know to this day how involved Charlie was in plan B directing it specifically. Sorry, there it's my dog with a nail. And, um, but once 
that became clear that senior NASA people who are very technically um, capable had developed all these relationships with industry. Some of them go to industry after for more money. That's a little disdainful. Um, And some of those Hill staffers who worked so hard to put these programs back in the budget at high levels went to industry for more money. That's, that's a cycle that's unhealthy for our nation's space program. And it's especially challenging when it's those people who were complaining that new space, I, I try not to call it in that in the book because I, it's not going to always be new. Um, but the SpaceX, um, blue origin number of new companies often get criticized you know for lobbying it's it's crazy it's just crazy because the traditional lobbyists are so good at it and they spend so much more and they considered the congress you know their constituency and i considered the public our constituency that that was the difficulty so i i actually don't blame congress or industry as much Partly because Congress is doing their job. They've got a constituency that's their own um, districts to support. Industry's got shareholders that they need to go and try and find the most money they can to give those people return. The administration and the government is really supposed to be leaders and incentivize the right behavior. And we weren't doing that. This was really a flashback for me to AP government and you know, the, the pork, pork barrel politics, iron triangle, maybe, maybe I have, I'm not sure if, if that one, that one applies here, but if, if any, if any AP government curriculum, uh, developers or textbook writers are listening, this would be a great case study to, to throw in there for, for those chapters. What are the, the benchmarks or, or KPIs, I suppose that you would use to judge NASA's progress and evolution. And so I will I will toss out a couple so you get a sense of what I'm sort of looking for, but maybe the percent of of work operations that are being purchased as a service versus owned and operated, uh, maybe the percentage of dollars that are, are are cost plus versus fixed price. I know that it's not this is a little bit simplistic, but I think you directionally see where I'm going. Do you have any sort of internal benchmarks that you use for that? Yeah, th- those are good ones. And, you know, having done this at a couple of jobs in my life, I I still hold to what I refer to in the book as, you know, right to left thinking. Uh, it depends on what your end state goal is. And those measurements of success should directly be tied to achieving that purpose. And so to me, we've had for a long time, really since Apollo, the goal to lower the cost of space transportation. Um, We hadn't done that. The shuttle was supposed to do it. It didn't do it, but we didn't follow those KPIs. We we, um, just really swept them under the rug even. program did uh, wonderful things. And I in no way want to denigrate the human spaceflight program in the last 40 years, but it was greatly lacking uh, in KPIs that would advance the goals that we had. Even the space station, when Reagan put that policy in, and of course, since the beginning, the shuttle and the station went together, uh, we were to design and manufacture miracle pharmaceuticals. We were to find new ways to expand the economic sphere. And that still hasn't happened. Well, the reason is it costs too darn much to get there and back or to use the facilities. And there aren't really the um, people on the space station who can do this. One of the stories in the book is a commercial experiment that that I helped champion at NASA and facilitate in the 90s once it finally got up to space and an individual, Bisk Johnson, had paid uh, for this research. The astronauts messed up the timing on the experiment and we got no results. That's, you know, that's, that's what you hope you'll overcome by having the actual researchers with these experiments. But you can only do that when the cost goes down. Yeah, yeah. Well, Let's put a bookmark in that. We will be, there's one KPI that I definitely want to talk about, but 
We are going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsor. Time for a short break to hear about our sponsors again. Space is the new frontier for cybersecurity. Spider Oak Mission Systems builds space cybersecurity solutions for civilian, military, and commercial space operations. Their Orbit Secure protocol delivers zero trust security to zero gravity environments, protecting space communication, command, control, data transmission, storage, and integrity at the data level. To learn more about how zero trust architectures will revolutionize security in new space, Download the new NSR Spider Oak sponsored white paper titled Space Cybersecurity, Current State and Future Needs. Find the white paper at spacecyber.com. Again, that's spacecyber.com. Or check out their website at spideroak-ms.com and tell them Pathfinder sent you. So we are back and we are still on KPIs. I want to hear a little bit more about the $1 billion ahead for, for astronaut transportation. Because I first heard you say that actually in Return to Space a few months ago, and but then you know you you expound on that in the book, and that is that you know that's quite a figure. So I would love to just hear a little bit more about that, and we don't really necessarily need to go into why that's too much because I think most of our listeners will be be aware of of what prices from at least the leading provider look like today. But can you just tell me a little bit more about that? Sure. Uh, this speaks to some of your early questions. You know, this was both a difficult but also interesting thing to research. NASA's budget, what I did to make this calculation is post-Apollo, okay, so from 72 on, we have spent... $900 billion in our, at NASA. So it's not that number. Uh, we spend about a third of NASA's budget on human spaceflight. So it, it, it's actually closer to a trillion. And so a third is $350 billion that we spent on human spaceflight since we went to the moon. We spent way more per person to go to the moon, as I'm sure people realize. But since then, all we've done is low Earth orbit and we sent about 350 people. So our human spaceflight program budget since that time divided by the number of people flown is how I got the billion number. I completely recognize that's not a marginal cost. Many people flew more than once, et cetera. Um, that's the straight math of it. Yeah, it's, I mean, it really, it really sticks out. And I know that there are a lot of footnotes and caveats that you you have to to add to that, but there the numbers going up now though. And there's another one actually. I saw someone. I don't remember where. I want to give credit, but I don't. I don't remember where I saw it. But the number of toilets in space has never been higher. Oh, not that. That there's a KPI, huh? Yeah, yeah. Oh, there. Well, there's there's one more that we are going to get to at the end of the show, but we can we can move on move on past KPIs for now. So, what was it like leaving NASA? The last time you left NASA? Leaving NASA is never pure joy because it's a wonderful organization and to be part of it is an amazing thing. I was, I did believe that I had made um, a difference there, which is what I wanted to do in a positive way. I believe we have gotten to a point in the programs, many of the ones that were priorities for me and the Obama administration where they had reached apogee, as I say in the book, and would continue. Um, but I do recall telling not just Charlie, but I, you know, I formally wrote a letter to the President of the United States um, since he had pointed me. And it, it's emotional. I really broke down with a couple of friends, as I told them, but you, I really did take the oath of working for the public so seriously. And I, it's an intense job. I had pushed people harder than they wanted to be pushed. And while I do say what's true in the book is that I wasn't looking to leave NASA. I had a outside, um, just a cold call from a recruiter that I, probably wouldn't have responded to though, if I felt, you know, I was absolutely in sync with the head of NASA and we were 
running on full steam and all the things we've done. I, I knew Charlie had stopped at that point really sharing with me that that's not really fair to have the head of NASA you know, not really trusting that his deputy was working toward the same thing. I was told at the end of the Obama administration's first term that if they were reelected, they would make a change at the head of NASA. Charlie's been very clear publicly. He wasn't on board in the early days of commercial space. And he even says at one point, which I don't think is true, he was the most hated person in the administration. I, I don't think that's true, but he felt that way. Um, there, there were concerns, his Muslim outreach comments that were never directed by President Obama, but Charlie said they were have continued to be something that the president has to deal with, the former president. So I, by that summer when Obama was uh, starting his second term, it was clear they really weren't going to change the administrator. I had this outstanding job offer and I decided to, to take it. So bittersweet. Yeah. And well, and also just wrote a book and, and narrated it too on the side. So you write at length about hailing from and having a non-technical background. And I really wanted to zero in on this because one that spoke to me, I'm, you know, come, come from, from similar walk of life, but also I think there are a lot of people who would want to break into the space industry who worry that the lack of an engineering degree or some other sort of technical background would immediately disqualify them. And then time and again, over the course of your career, you faced a lot of uh, probably, not probably, you faced you know sexist comments and just tons and tons of criticism unwarranted about the non-technical background. Uh, but as you say, at some point in the book, political science can often be more complicated, more tricky, harder than rocket science. Maybe not harder, but you know, very, very tricky. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? First, that last comment. I know I'm reversing here, but but then also just talk about maybe maybe give some words of inspiration to anyone who wants to break into space but doesn't have a super technical background. Sure. The aspect of political science that is more challenging than rocket science to me is that it is not a constant, you know, I, as I say, we overcame gravity. It was, it, it's a constant and really smart people can work on that problem. And the problem itself doesn't change. Whereas political science, I think a lot of engineers who just think, well, we ought to be able to get the money to do this because we like building big rockets, um, are just not really understanding uh, when you are spending the public's money, how we have checks and balances to go about doing that in a way that addresses national needs. I mean, NASA isn't in the Constitution. Uh, we don't just have an entitlement to our budget. We have to be investing in ways that are returning value to the health and welfare security of the nation. And I believe NASA does that very well, but we need to better keep those things in mind as we create our programs so we leave the world a better place that that is not disconnected. And I I try not to use the word in, in, entitled too much in the book, but there were times when I felt like these rocket scientists seemed acted entitled. They would say when I was in Alabama at the Marshall Space Flight Center the morning that Elon announced the Falcon Heavy. He called it the Big FR back then. It wasn't called that Falcon Heavy. And they said to me, Lori, tell your friend Elon, he's not really my friend, but okay, this is our lane. We got the big rockets. We finally accepted you know, your little side project. They, they didn't think, I don't think that it would be successful of commercial crew, but we do the big rockets. And I was explaining to them that, well, this is government money and actually we're not competing against our industry. We are riding point. Think of it instead of, you know, a running race in different lanes, we're riding point and they're drafting behind us. And if one of them 
gets the capability beyond us can, to take the next hill we or to to pass us we don't get out our tire pump and poke it in their spokes um uh we take the next hill we drive to something new that industry can't do again to bring the team along with and as i say sort of the snarky comment in the book i don't think cycling's that big in the south they they didn't accept that they felt that they should be able to build a big rocket just to build one so that to to the point of how people are needed beyond just technical degrees here i was as the deputy of nasa i had just 18,000 people many of whom had unique technical skills and today these are specialties and no one can know everything my job was to help shape programs and policies so that the capabilities of the agency could best contribute toward the value of the nation. That's the job. Um, so it's, it's really when you have engineers in these jobs, sometimes they are focused on things that are less important to the public and political science therefore pushes back and says, wait, why are you doing that? For how much? And, um, you know, we have our champions in Congress, the handful who have jobs in their districts, but the value needs to be felt by more members of Congress. And that only happens if you're doing something that touches constituencies beyond just these NASA centers and contractors. Speaking to your first part of this question about how people without engineering and science degrees can be welcomed into the community. Yes, I am an example. And early on, this was very easy. I, at the National Space Society, was providing testimony about what NASA should be doing. I was running a nonprofit, so it was a management kind of job. And at NASA, I started developing policy with this master's degree in space policy. Like there's really uh, a number of people throughout the book say I wasn't qualified to do my job. And I think I was easier to attack because she's not technical. And I have quotes from a lot of people doing that in sexist ways in, in the book, of course. Um, part of this was just, I was serving as the deputy under a two-star Marine general astronaut, African-American hero in every sense of, of the word, you know, a fighter pilot flown for shuttle missions to as commander. And he wasn't articulating this meaningful program and the change. He, he was giving it lip service, which he had to, um, and maybe on the side saying how he really felt, but they're Th their real play was attack the girl who did it, who doesn't have technical credentials. I mean, they, they didn't, that, that was their hand. And they bet that the Obama administration wouldn't back me. There were many calls to fire, to get me fired and to go to the Obama administration. I think Charlie even asked for me to be replaced once or twice, I'm told, but they weren't going to do that. And then I give them credit for that. They stood up to the program they proposed in some ways, as I outlined in the book, not as much as I would have. Hmm. Yeah. This thought is just occurring to me, but kind of only in space, right? That's, that's a uh, strange bedfellows between political scientists or people trained within that discipline. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I want to put words in your mouth, but I think as you write, a lot of the space billionaires uh, have like a very a libertarian bent that's not a uh, combination that I, that I, I had, I, it's not a connection I'd ever drawn. Um, but that's funny, but it's, it's space. There you go. Yeah. It, it made for an, uh, interesting dynamic. And I think in the beginning, Elon and Jeff were less controversial than they are now, frankly. Um, you know, they weren't first and second wealthiest people on the entire planet. Um, and Elon has sort of come into his Twitter verse uh, following and feeding that. Yeah, at the time he was controversial because he, he was, if he succeeded, going to be undermining an aerospace industry that was making tens of billions of dollars and charging huge amounts to launch things uh, and people to space. And anybody 
who would have come to undercut that would have been problematic. But he did it with this Silicon Valley sort of spirit. He didn't um, disrupt their mindset. Really, yeah, he he had a disruptive mindset, and NASA and aerospace industry had always been collegial, and that was a shock to the system. Yeah, yeah. So looking, go look, looking forward to the present day. Who are the space pirates now? And you use a term early in the book that I really liked, the space elites. Who are the space pirates? Who are the space elites now? Well, the space pirates, I go into quite a bit because I really, and there's a lot of confusion about it. When I started at the National Space Society in the 1980s, we were merging with the L5 Society. They were started by Gerard O'Neill. Well, he didn't start it, but these were followers of Dr. Gerard O'Neill, who was a Princeton professor who had written and studied uh, how we could take humanity off the planet and have large rotating structures, human habitats. You could take um, materials used from asteroids to develop solar power satellites. This was a vision that the space pirates, as I call them, and these early people in, included um, Jim Muncy, Rick Tomlinson, uh, Gary Hudson, who started a rocket company, a couple of rocket companies. All through the 80s and 90s, people were starting rocket companies. I, I have a chapter dedicated to this that ends by talking about the more famous space pirates today, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Richard Branson. But I include that term and I think the original ones are just people who didn't want to just do what the government said. And that's, you know, pirates. We, we're going we're gonna to go there. And if we find some treasure, uh, we might just keep it if there's no laws governing it. And a lot of times space pirates in um, science fiction uh, and film have been depicted as like in The Martian. You know, he's there exploiting uh, Mars, we didn't have the laws exactly set up to do so, but he needed to survive. Um, I think Han Solo's even referred to as a space pirate as, at some point, you know, flipping around yeah. the galaxy. I think, I think. But space elites. I think that's. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think that SpaceX or Starlink, I forget, but one of them have, has in their terms of service that, that Mars is, uh, you know, free, free reign. I need, I need, I'll need to ch check on that, but, but that they're self-governed or something. Yeah. Well, good luck with that. You know, we, we, we got a lot of sorting out to do with our governance as our, um, as we keep up with the technology, but space elites, that's very interestingly, probably changing a bit. My, my reference was to the people in power who are, um, typically making the decisions, many of them former astronauts, many of them running companies where, and, and I, I would say in Congress, that's maybe changing because right now I, I don't see how you could not have Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos be a space elite. So maybe you can be an elitist pirate. Yeah, there you go. There you go. They're, they're converging a little bit. And on the topic of converging, I've spoken with this a bit with previous guests, but I think that in a lot of ways, space, the space industry broadly defined and kind of the technology industry, there's, there's a lot of convergence there. And so I've been thinking a lot about how team space broadly defined competes with big tech for talent, because that's difficult to do on price alone. Do you have any thoughts on that? I'm sure that is true. And in fact, a huge aspect to this transition is being able to tap uh, the top talent of the nation and in some sense, the, the planet. Um, in the early days of the space program, there was no question. Uh, if you were a technically minded boy, let's face it, uh, you, you wanted to work at NASA. Um, and unfortunately, NASA had not been, again, sort of aligned with the national objectives in a way that that 
made that the case. I mean, I still meet people always who, when they learn about my career, talk about their grandfather who worked at NASA and their whole family is still proud of it. And so getting back to that was something I, I thought NASA needed to do because the agency itself is having trouble recruiting. Um, SpaceX found a way to make this a uh, hot topic again and really interesting because one of the pushbacks against transitioning to the private sector just for the transportation was that people wouldn't be interested if it wasn't NASA. I said, well, you know, I'd go to these student um, science fairs and you, you'd you have people have stickers on, you know, their case for their science experiment that had the NASA uh, logo, also Virgin Galactic, also SpaceX. They didn't see a difference. And that's what we were trying to do. This, this isn't us and them. So right now, having these companies have the ability to attract workforce from tech, they need to, again, keep, I think, not... I, I know there's a bunch of current things we can talk about here. I am a little concerned because we've had these recent uh, pushback on some of Elon's messages, certainly Jeff as well, to, to some extent, billionaire blowback. Uh, I, I worry that they will have a tougher time recruiting the talent if they aren't seen as a workplace that values these broader positive objectives. And, you know, NASA, I think still is somewhere people, it's it's hard to, hard to, when someone asks you where you work and you say NASA, not to do that with a smile. And I'm sure that's, that's the same for, for these commercial aerospace companies. And something that may have to do with that, I mean, really the Big traditional aerospace companies have that to some extent, but when you work there, you're probably working on a military program, you know, and that's and that's not going to seem as something. Or, or I don't know, some of these programs is are they really directed at things that we should be spending so much money on? Are they done in the highest value? There's all those questions, and hopefully, we we will. I, I doubt that the problem will be between big tech and the aerospace companies because I mean, big tech has their own issues these days. Yeah. 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 Well, you actually started to read my mind in some of those comments, but, and I don't think you, I think that you're one of the the most foremost authorities on this and can speak to it very empirically and intelligently. So I'd be remiss not to ask, how does the space industry do a better job diversifying its ranks? Well, this is very important to me, and I put a lot of thought into it. And one of the the ways we are addressing it is with programs that I initially helped co-found, which was the Brooke Owens Fellowship. I think we need to attract early in people's careers, and in this program's case, it's college, um, people who can get experience in the field, people who can get mentors and also have a cohort of people who sort of look and respect, you know, them as individuals. And the Brooke Owens Fellowship is for collegiate women and gender minorities. We then, a couple of years ago, started the Patty Gray Smith Fellowship, which is for African-American students. Um, There are many other similar fellowships starting because I think the impact of these has, if I do say so myself, been huge, just much, much more than I could have imagined. And the companies have, to their credit, just really been supportive. We have a wait list of hosts. We have 50 Brooke Owens Fellows, 40 Petty Grace Fel- Smith Fellows this summer with waiting lists of people who want to have them, with people coming uh, who want to be mentors to them. You can't just throw people in and say, enjoy it. These are people that need support. And you, I think we need to get to that critical mass. The next step, though, is to have people in leadership positions. So we all have inherent biases and promoting people who don't 
look or maybe think the way that we do is important and then valuing their ideas and opinions when they get in those roles. Those that still work ahead, but we've got now several hundred a year new employees in the system from diverse backgrounds who are going to have ideas that help us all be better. And that was the goal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that you are a living testimony to the idea that having people who think differently and can, can drive positive change from within. And I mean, there, there are some, some really good stories, but I will, I will rather than, rather than tell them, I will, I want to drive people to buy your book. So I think that's a good, good place to close out the substantive portion of this, but there, there's a few more quick questions. And again, we will actually come to some of the, the more fun vignettes and, and stories from the book, but I won't, I won't, uh, I won't spoil all of them. But the first one is returning to the topic of KPIs, elephant payloads. Would you support creating a new metric standard or classification system for, for launch payloads that is denominated in elephants? And I don't know if you've seen, but there's been tabloids and I think the European Space Agency made an April Fool's joke about class classifying asteroids based on giraffe, like how big they are in giraffe sizes. So, so yeah, what are what are your thoughts on that on an on animal metric system? And, and I think Tori Bruno's done a good job on Twitter with whales. I haven't seen that one. And how there many he can fit? So it's it's fabulous. So yeah, my my. Quick story was I happened upon since I left NASA at um, a NASA conference a brochure that listed how many as uh, how many elephants the SLS could launch and I did a quick <laughs> I think it was eighteen and and then I did a quick estimate of how many then could be launched by the Falcon Heavy because it was just launching and wrote an op ed about that and then if you looked at the amount of money you could really launch hundred more than a hundred elephants for the same cost of these 18 that were going on SLS. And if you really take that far, you can maybe understand why the spacesuits would be so expensive because I think astronaut suits for elephants with those trunks, that, that's going to be a big challenge. Um, just the thought of having a bunch of astronauts in spacesuits walking around on the moon can be interesting, but yeah, that drove me crazy because the whole point of this is not that it's big. It's that we are doing meaningful things. We are launching things that have helped society. You know, we know more about our planet than we ever would have without a space program. We often say the dinosaurs are extinct because they didn't have a space program. We are learning and should be learning, um, how to benefit humanity from going to space and not not just building a building a rocket because it is large. Yeah, 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 that's a good point. But I have to I have to admit I might use the elephant metric a little bit in payload. I won't I won't overdo it though. As long as you keep it, as long as you are clear that uh, there are broader and more meaningful points. I I think we need to to be silly and we need to find ways to reach people who haven't been fully embracing what NASA is doing. But people in all walks of life look at this and think, what? Final question, when you were over in, in Star Star City in, in Russia and you were in the vestibular chair, the rotating chair, you were listening to John Denver songs. What what John Denver songs were you listening to? Well, we, we can get to that, but first, just yeah, walk 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 us, our listeners through through that that story. Getting this close. Astro Mom was the Astro Mom was the name I gave a project where I was training to be going to space to the space station on a Soyuz rocket um, with a sponsored. Um, flight, I would be having my millions paid for by the private sector. I'm not a wealthy person. 
this came about real quick because I had a client who was paying his way after 9-11. He could no longer go. There was less than a year till the flight. They didn't have time to market the flight to tourists. This was at the very beginning. I would have been the third space tourist, I think, first female. And for all these reasons, I had sponsors and I was raising money. I had a really bargain basement price for 10 days on the space station of $12 million. While I was there doing the training, Lance Bass showed up. Uh, that story is told in the book. It's many people's favorite chapter, Lance Bass from InSync. And it is true. I did not know who Lance Bass was when I first, I was in Russia when I, when my office called and told me this. And then I said, is he the cute one? Um, <laughs> and, and he was, that was the one I thought of as, as cute. So it was fun to have him over there, even though his plan really undermined mine. It's not exactly clear what would have happened, but passing the vestibular test for, um, training for me was challenging. I was a 40 year old when this was happening. And I don't know about other people, but as I get older, I'm less able to withstand the twirling. I love all amusement park rides uh, as a kid. But so the first test, I did not do well. I was going to get sick and the doctors take you off if that's going to happen. Because once you do it on the chair and anytime you get back on it, that's just going to happen. It's like a memory <laughs> muscle thing. Um, and I had a doctor in Russia. She had been with the Russian space program for a long time. And she was very interested in me succeeding. So, so she suggested that the thing to keep your heart rate and perspiration down, which is the signals that um, you are measured on, you needed to think about something that kept you calm. Like, what's your best memory? So my client actually did math problems in his head to keep him calm. Math problems do not keep me calm. So that was not going to be it. And she was concerned, you know, are you going to be on a beach or something? Well, my kids were like five and seven at the time or seven and nine. And I was used to tucking them in and singing to them. And I knew that was when I was most happy and calm. So I asked, could I sing? So I wasn't listening to John Denver. I was singing. And I sang sunshine on my shoulder makes me happy because I always sang that to them because they're like my little sunshine. Um, and uh, uh, country roads. I'm a huge John Denver geek. So maybe even grandma's feather bed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that is, I think that's, that's a great, great image to end on but this all begs the the final question that i have is when when are you going to go to space well i do i guess believe i will go in my lifetime i am 61 right now i am not signed up for any of the suborbital flights i would gladly go if if offered but i'm not a wealthy person and don't have a reservation but i think the price will come down and i i I guess I'm hopeful to actually, well, I, I, who wouldn't want to go to the moon? We were walking on the moon when I was eight years old. So sort of seemed like I might do that. That's probably a little less likely, but going for a longer period of time on orbit would be amazing. One of these commercial space stations. Um, but I'll take a barnstorm ride to sober where to lift somebody's offering. There you go. So if anyone out there is is listening, you know who to call. Lori, thank you so much for coming on the show. This was great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad you enjoyed the book. All righty. That is it for Pathfinder 0005. I would be a terrible hype man if I didn't plug Lori's book. If you're interested in getting your own copy, head to lorigarver.com. Lori is spelled L-O-R-I. And there you'll find options to buy Escaping Gravity from a local bookstore, Barnes & Noble, Jeff Bezos, and more. There's also a link to order a signed copy if that strikes your fancy. Thanks again to Lori for joining us. I'm Ryan Duffy signing off, and I'll see you back here next week.